Thank you, Lars Eric. Yeah, sorry that I'm not in the room there, but I hope uh, it works this way as well. Um, so let me start by thanking the four presenters for their thought provoking presentations. I think the presentations we've heard were excellent and it's an absolute pleasure for me to, to be able to comment on these presentation and offer some reflections from my part. Um, I think each of the presentation has a, a, a very interesting research question and the, the, the presentation and the associated research is really based on, on fascinating uh, original data collection and, and very meticulous uh, empirical analysis. I also think the findings that come out are, are interesting. They are interesting not only because they they help us understand new theoretical and empirical issues that are involved in these questions, but they're also important because they have important policy implications. And the presenters haven't spoken a lot about this in the presentation, and I will be asking some questions maybe to get them to reflect on that a little bit. Now, having said this, I have to say it's, it's quite a challenge to find common threads or themes across these papers. Um, given that they analyze and study very different topics, very different questions, focus on different time periods and, 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 and different geographical location. Yet for me, I think there are two important themes or conclusions that come out of these four presentations. Um, the first one and is the fact that these presentations on the score that the role of ethnic uh, identities, ethnic or otherwise, as a cause or a contributing factor to conflict or the development of um, peaceful societies remains a hugely important field of study. Now, despite the extensive body of research that has emerged on these issues in the last 20 years or so, I think many questions and issues are not well researched and not well understood. And I think these presentations show us that there are indeed a lot of issues left to be researched and investigated. Now, a second important theme that I think I, I want to highlight here and, and draw out of this uh, presentation is most closely associated with the, the presentation of, of Marijke. Um, Marijke, in our, in our paper with Bert and Reginas, uh, analyzed the political representation uh, and, and particularly how political representation is being perceived in Rwanda and Burundi. And given the fact that people act and react on the basis of their perceptions of reality, I agree with these authors that it's indeed crucial to better understand what drives these perceptions of political representation. But more than that, I think we should not only be interested in understanding and analyzing how political representation or political inequalities are being perceived. But I think it's crucial for us to better understand how perceptions of other types of inequalities, be it in the economic sphere or in the social sphere of regarding cultural status um, are being perceived by individuals and group in society. And the reason why this is so important in my view is that um, for long-term stability, and, 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 and uh, durable peace, perceptions of these uh, inequalities, of these group-based inequalities, or horizontal inequalities, are crucially important. Now, in the reminder of my brief commentary, and I think I have 10 more minutes left, I will provide some comments and raise some questions concerning each of the presentations. My questions, as I said before, will not only be uh, focusing on some of the theoretical arguments that are being put forward by the presenters, but I also are also aimed at getting um, insights from the presenters regarding possible policy implications of their research for countries coming out of conflict or countries in search of durable peace. Now, let me get to the first presentation by Marijke. The, the, the presentation uh, by Marijke is based on a paper by, by Bert Ingelare and uh, Marijke and uh, Reginas. And as I said before, um, uh, it focuses on perceptions of political representation in Rwanda and Burundi, two countries uh, 
who have, that have experienced widespread ethnic violence at different times in their post-colonial history. Now, for me, this presentation and the associated paper is special for, for two reasons. Most importantly, this presentation is special because it's based on the work and research that was initiated and to a large extent conducted by Bert Ingelar, who, as, as Marijke mentioned in her presentation, is unfortunately no longer with us. Now, Bert was not only a wonderful person, but he also was a truly outstanding researcher and undoubtedly one of the experts with regard to conflicts in the Great Lake region in Africa. And I applaud Marika and Reginas for their excellent efforts in further developing and writing up that research. The, the second reason why the research presented by Marika and, and Reginas is hugely important is because it addresses an issue um, which is not well understood and has not received sufficient research attention. As mentioned earlier, perceptions of political representation and inequalities are not widely studied, are not widely uh, understood, despite established linkages between inequality, especially group-based or horizontal inequality, and the emergence or re-emergence of violent conflict. I thought the paper that I was sent offered a fascinating read. Um, I have a couple of questions, and, and I will limit it in the, in the interest of time to two questions. The first question, if I have understood the paper correctly in the presentation, is that improvements in perceptions of political representation after the conflict, uh, particularly in Rwanda, was mainly driven by improvements in people's perceived substantive representation. I think this is an interesting finding and, and it suggests, I think at least, that a regime that delivers in terms of developmental outcomes will be seen to be representative. Now, this seems to be quite similar to China's model or, or social contract it has with its people. But if perceptions of political representation are based too much on developmental outcomes, and hence a regime has as only outcome legitimacy, will such a situation not inevitably lead to sharp swings in political support for the political regime in charge and possibly result in occasional bouts of political instability, tensions, and possibly conflict? A second question relates to the demography aspects. In both Burundi and Rwanda, Tutsis represent about 15% of the total population and Hutus about 85% of the population. How do groups' demographic shares in the total population relate to perceptions of political representation? Are people aware of these large differences in population size? And how does this awareness or lack thereof affect their perceptions of political representation? Let me move on to the second presentation, the presentation by uh, Rin, Rinshan on, on the hybrid governance and conflict in Pakistan Northwest frontier. I th think it's, it's interesting to draw attention. It's an, I think it's important to draw attention to the fact of the lasting legacies of colonialism. And also the fact that um, colonialism should not be seen as a uniform event. In particular, if you want to understand institutional differences and or, or differences in, in institutional arrangements and state society relations, it's important to take these elements into account. I have two, I guess, two questions I want to relate of or I want to, to put forward here. On the one hand, is um, the presenter stated that hybrid forms of governance. Are, are much more fluid and unstable uh, in, in, and, and, and cause much more uh, un instability. And hence, fluidity of governance systems are presented as something that is detrimental and negative. I was wondering whether there are situations in which this fluidity can actually become a strength rather than a weakness or a problematic characteristic of a particular governance system. Second question relates to the fact that, that the, the, to the statement that hybrid governments arrangements are not very shock resistant, according to the analysis. 
and hence this makes them more conflict prone. I'm wondering in this regard, what can and should be done in the short term and long term respectively to reduce the conflict risk of such institutional arrangements? Can hybrid government arrangements be made more shock resistant? Or is the only way to reduce the risk of conflict in the situation the introduction of more formal government arrangements or more formal institutions of conflict management. Let me quickly move on to the third presentation by Omar. Now, in his, in his presentation, he, he, he focused on a number of theoretical and empirical findings and insights, which he developed more fully in his excellent book, The Path to Genocide in Rwanda. I think the book is highly original and offers very interesting new ways of thinking about violence and mobilization in Rwanda and beyond. And I have one question I want to ask regarding the third point that Omar was making, uh, the, the, the link between radicalization and violence. In this respect, I, I, just to remind everyone, he argues that radicalization can not only lead to violence, but the violence can also lead to radicalization. And indeed, he argues convincingly, I think, that causation runs in both directions. Now, while the argument rings true to me intuitively and also theoretically, it's still not really clear to me how pervasive, pervasive or universal the connection from conflict to radicalization is. So I want to pose the question, under which circumstances is violent conflict likely to result in the radicalization of, of people? Are all people equally susceptible to become radicalized? Or are some people immune and can withstand pressures to radicalize and, and, and commit uh, horrendous acts of violence? Moving on to the last presentation by Tuba. On, um, on, on the question whether primary education has, this, has decreased the likelihood of insurgency in Turkey. That's obviously an interesting question. And in the, in the literature on education and conflict, it's, it's a well-known fact, I would say, that education has two faces. And on the one hand, it can, it's argued to contribute to, conf offer to, to peace, uh, by some of the mechanisms that Tukba has, has nicely set out. But there's also a lot of literature showing that education might actually be a contributing factor to violent conflict. Uh, think about schools and, and national curricula that are being used to indoctrinate young people and may actually be used to disseminate hate and polarize people. So, Understanding under which circumstances and in which context education is likely to contribute to peace, stability, and social cohesion, and in which scenarios and in which cases it leads or might lead to, to conflict and, and violent group mobilization is a crucial question. Because it's also one of the areas where we think we can have an influence on, on, on creating long-term uh, long stability. Now, the, 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 the results of the paper are interesting in that regard, that the prevalence and availability in this regard of primary education um, did not lead to an insurgent or an, a decrease insurgency participation, quite the contrary. And Tukba, in, in, in the conclusion, speaks about a possible backlash effect of the adoption and introduction of centralized education with a national curriculum and, 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 and a national, a national uh, institutions um, structuring and, 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 and uh, structuring the, the educational curricula. Now, I want to ask a question about that. More specifically, I would like to, uh, to, to reflect maybe a little bit more on which circumstances, in which circumstances such a backlash is more likely or less likely to occur? And how can we actually avoid such a backlash from occurring? I will leave it at that. I, will, I look forward to our discussion and I thank the presenters for their very nice presentation. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Arnim, for uh, really extensive uh, comments, a lot of food for thought for uh, our presenters. But I'm not going to turn over the word to them uh, uh, as of yet, because uh, I think we should allow the audience to put a few questions. We are uh, running behind schedule, and I'm going to allow this panel to run over time just a few minutes. Uh, so I hope there are going to, there's going to be no starvation in, in the room in the interim. Uh, but uh, I would like to invite uh, everyone uh, or anyone uh, to stick up a hand and we will hand over a microphone. I think we have one question here. Uh, so would you please, we can start over here, yes. Question and some thoughts are for Rinchen actually. Um, so first, and maybe you have this in the list of robustness checks, um, but are you able to look at um, kind of trends between these places uh, in the pre-colonial time just to show that you know they were kind of similar in other things even before colonization um, so maybe data from gazetteers or so on just to look at um, before as well um, and the second was that in terms of the in terms of the different types of mechanisms, I mean, you showed us the mechanisms that you think are plausible, but also the ones that are maybe not plausible. Um, so maybe political shifts or things that you think are likely not to happen. Um, and then third, also this, um, you you mentioned that there's a rise in violence against state. Is, is it true that there is no rise or the difference across the discontinuity you know, uh, for other types of violence, is is that unchanged? Um, and if yes, that would be interesting to see. Sorry, I've, I took too long. Thank no, you. no, that's fine. Uh, so uh, please also, for the following uh, interventions, try to uh, be as brief as possible so we uh, are able to give the panel a chance to respond. Please. Hi, and I had a question for the last presenter on uh, the education uh, um, so, uh, in terms of mechanisms, uh, why do you think education would lead to more conflict? Is it because of the nature of the curriculum and the nature of what is taught, which um, which gives rise to this identity issue, uh, or um, are there uh, other things which might also be different in the places uh, where uh, education um, there's more education versus less education? Are there other Factors, can you rule out other factors um, of reasons for conflict uh, in your uh, robustness checks? Hello, I'm Pai Kanista from UN Women. And just linking to the panel session we had earlier, where somebody said it's always about resources and, and power over them. So I wanted to ask in your research about ethnicity and perceived ethnicity, did you see links how that was used, ethnicity, for uh, getting access to uh, resources and, and their decision making and how that affected inclusion? Thank you. So I have one question for uh, Rinchen that uh, do you also test and see whether there are differences in public good availability uh, between these two areas? So in line with like Banerjee papers that show divergence in public good provision affecting welfare. And uh, I have one question for uh, Tukpa that uh, in terms of the language of instruction, when it changes to the national language, do you observe larger school dropouts for, for people for whom that's not their home language? So I'm kind of thinking that would also have uh, future labor market implications and increased resentment for that kind of uh, an instruction. Thank you so much. I have two questions, one for Malike, I think. Um, I want to understand why is colonial legacy so stubborn in the case of uh, Pakistan? And my question to Omar, um, I think when you were talking about the role of emotions, I think I understood the argument that you are trying to make. And my question was, how do you know that 
people, when they are assessing, you know, when they are trying to exercise their, their rationality that they have uh, good quality information, because I would say maybe how can you account for the, the possibility of uh, maybe uh, over um, evaluating one's capabilities uh, without taking into account the emotions because you know, you know as human beings we are also fiber you know we can have our limitations when we are assessing situations thank you but in in any case uh, at this point I would uh, I think we have to close uh, the uh, questions from the audience and we're going to turn to the members, uh, the speakers, uh, and so we're, we're going to go in the same order as before, and I think each speaker has roughly two minutes, so be selective. Uh, you don't have to answer all questions. You can uh, talk to uh, the people in the room, but uh, uh, in particular, uh, please try to respond to Arnim's uh, points, so please go ahead. Especially to Arnim uh, for, for intervening from a distance and also um, for expressing again his appreciation for Bert's uh, work. We, we really appreciate that and his family as well who is following uh, online today. Um, and of course we try to continue the legacy of his work but it is of course with uh, mixed feelings um, as we would uh, rather have him with us. Um, so Arnie made two comments. The one was indeed if um, the legitimacy of a regime is only based on substantive representation, it is fragile, it's vulnerable to economic uh, shocks. And I, I share your concern. On the other hand, if you look at the uh, data and certainly at the uh, milestone um, moments uh, of formalistic representation where descriptive representation is agreed upon or um, brought in practice, you see that even Hutu in Rwanda experience or report a surge in perceived political representation, which means that they no longer associate the regime just with an ethnic identity. So I think uh, at least my reading of the data is that besides the substantive representation, this policy of uh, reconciliation also is entering the hearts and minds of people after a while, but it, it, it took time. But it could be that after a while, indeed, the salience has decreased, of ethnicity has decreased to such a point uh, that um, this vulnerability to a drop in substantive representation has, has also lowered. But of course, time will tell, and any shock also, I mean, any ethnic, um, incident even in the neighboring country, Burundi, like Omar said, could, could actually spark these uh, feelings again. Then on demography, people know uh, that Tutsi are a minority of about 15% and Hutu a majority of 85%. And actually, if you see the power sharing in Burundi, the Tutsi minority of 15%, demographic minority, uh, has uh, uh, ethnic quotas of 40%, which is quite uh, generous, certainly if you compare it to the Hutu majority in Rwanda, who lost the monopoly on power, and has de facto maybe 40% of ministerial portfolios. But this is uh, uh, not public data, it's based on our own investigations of the identity of uh, uh, power holders in, in Rwanda. And I have zero minutes, uh, but I will just <laughs> say that uh, in terms of uh, resources in Rwanda Burundi, it's rather the scarcity of resources than the abundance of resources that uh, plays a role in the violence, um, in particular to mobilize uh, people um, and motivate them to fight. Um, hi, I'll be, I'll be quick to respond to the questions that were asked. Um, thanks, Arnim, for, for, for your very important questions. Uh, with regards to, you mentioned uh, fluidity is presented as a negative. Could fluidity be a strength? I would say that uh, it's more about fragility of the hybrid governance uh, system or institution rather than the fluidity. And it was fragile in the sense that it, you know, it, was, a, it was a colonial era 
uh, system that was put in place where sovereignty was shared by the center with tribal elites on the ground. Uh, they were given some form of autonomy in terms of, you know, kind of uh, maintaining a political order in their areas, but also the state um, had implemented some exceptional legal instruments and arrangements whereby they could from time to time, uh, in fact, interact and intervene when they felt that, you know, the social order was close to collapsing or it did indeed collapse in the col colonial era with, with, you know, conflicts happening in, in these tribal areas. So uh, this system, which was fragile, was adopted by, with some modifications by the post-colonial independent state in Pakistan which then basically uh, with these minor modifications continued pretty much up until the US invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, which is where we show this unlocking and violence. So in answer to one of the questions that was raised by the audience, do you have any pretrends? Essentially, we see no difference between hybrid and non-hybrid areas prior to the US invasion of Afghanistan. It's only that shock that you know unlocks this. So the result I showed, um, I didn't manage to show one of the further uh, supplementary results, was that the, the difference in conflict between hybrid and non-hybrid areas is primarily driven by the post-2001 uh, era, the post-US invasion era. So there's, you know, this system, uh, remarkably fragile system, worked well in managing conflict. But then, but then when a shock happens, the fragility of this system is such to shocks that, that, that you know, violence unlocks itself. With regards to Arnim's second question, um, what could be uh, a possible solution uh, with regards vis-a-vis -vis these hybrid areas? In fact, your suggestion, Arnim, is uh, absolutely on point. We need more formalized institutions in these areas, right? We need more formal uh, forms of conflict management. We need police presence. We need formalized courts, constitutional courts, and we need uh, electoral politics to kind of penetrate further. Uh, the Pakistani state has formally, de jure, uh, introduced, you know, um, uh, kind of elections and district administration in these areas, but de facto, none of it has, has really taken place on the ground. And this de jure change even happened very recently. So let's see, you know, that's something that, that remains to be seen um, on the ground. Um, and in, in answer to one of the questions, one final question about, um, you know, differences in public goods. Uh, that is something that we uh, for sure are going to test. I showed you balance on climatic as well as geographic dimensions, but public goods dimension is another one that we want to show the balance test for, for spatial RD. Uh, but one of the things is because the variation that we're picking up in our RD estimation comes from such a narrow buffer zone around the hybrid border, we feel that even public goods provision, things like roads or rail, railroads or you know, other kinds of public infrastructure, hopefully the balance test will, 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 will pass, but that's something that we're gonna incorporate as the next step in our, in our data set. Thank you. Thanks. So, I'll try to make three points in two minutes in the reverse order that they were Posed. So there was a question from this gentleman about how do we know whether emotions are driving the decisions that we make? And it's a kind of relevant question if we think about what's going on in Ukraine at the moment and the way that we frame Putin's decision. Um, on the one hand, he's framed as, a, you know, he's lost it, right? He's emotional. Um, on the other hand, perhaps it isn't that. Perhaps it's that he's simply... You know, he made a calculation and he simply made a miscalculation that, um, that, uh, that there would be as much resistance and there would be as much support as there was in Ukraine. So the answer to the question is, it's really obviously very difficult to know what's going on inside the mind of an individual. It doesn't stop psychologists from having a go though. There is quite an extensive body of research where they do try to cue individuals um, with emotions to see how that affects their decision-making processes. In my case, I'm simply inferring from observed behavior and coming up with the most theoretically reasonable explanation, which in my view was it's a combination of both cognitive and effective processes. There was a question about the role of resources and ethnicity. Yes, I mean, this panel is entitled Ethnicity, Inequality, and, I, and 
something else. But resources obviously do matter when it comes to inequality. But I would actually go back to, I guess, the 19th century and to Weber. So Weber, when he talks about inequality, he talks about three different bases of inequality, of which resources, by which he means economic material resources, is only one. The other is power, um, and Moeika talked about how political power is a very important driver of conflict and also reconciliation after conflict, but also prestige or status. And this is more closely in line with what I've been looking at about symbolic and identity and <coughs> things that are much more intangible to be able to measure. But prestige as a very important dimension of inequality. Um, it, it kind of explains why it is that, for example, poor uh, non-college educated whites in the United States vote against their material interests and vote for the Republican Party, despite its redistribution preferences. And then Arnhem. Um, Thank you, by the way, Arnim, for, uh, Arnim, so you should know, only knew that I was going to present my book about 48 hours ago, and I sent him the link to the e-copy. I, I don't believe Arnim would have had the time to do so, but nonetheless, I appreciate the fact that he engaged with uh, the point. So Arnim asks me about the third point, about radicalization being a consequence of violence. So, and he asked specifically the question of, well, is it true that everybody is equally susceptible? No, no, there is individual heterogeneity. Um, from, from a social science perspective, what we would want to know about this heterogeneity is the distribution of that heterogeneity uh, across societies and across time. You only have to look at some of the classic psychosocial work um, on violence, for example, so Stanley Milgram's experiments from the 1960, Philip Zimbardo's experiments from the 1970, Solomon Ash's experiments from the 1950s, we take all that research and we think, well, that means that in anybody is capable of committing violence under the right circumstances. What we often miss in that research is that we look at the sample sizes, there's actually quite a significant number of people who do not turn the dial all the way to the very end in the case of Stanley Milgram's experiment, and who refuse to become uh, abusive prison guards in the case of Solomon Asher's experiment. So clearly there is individual heterogeneity um, because individuals differ in their disposition towards violence and therefore by extension to their susceptibility to radicalization. Okay, so uh, should I? Okay, so uh, about Arnim's question uh, regarding where we could see this backlash effect most, I think this completely depends on the uh, nature of the education curriculum in a country and how exclusive or inclusive it is. Unfortunately, because this is a very hard thing to uh, identify and measure across different countries, uh, as far as I know, there is no uh, data that we can use to measure that or to see where we can see this ba backlash effect. But I think the content of education, the educational content and the curriculum and also the rituals embedded in the education system are very important and how exclusive they are will determine how much backlash they will receive uh, in terms of participation and, of, uh, participation and insurgency, I think. Um, a second question was about how this backlash effect uh, like occurs in practice. So I think uh, being excluded from like the uh, school, like if you see as a m member of a minority group, if you see yourself or your identity or culture, it, if it's being excluded from curriculum or school content, this is likely to create some um, uh, grievance, even, even if it's not like uh, about material material circumstances. This will still mean that you're excluded uh, from some area that uh, that belongs to you uh, originally, and therefore this may actually induce grievances, as is the case with like economic grievances and. Uh, of course, it's a big threat to group identity, and against this threat, uh, it's very likely that this backlash effect may um, incent give incentives to some young people to join insurgencies. And there was another question about how much uh, student enrollment is, uh, given that uh, the instruction language is not uh, Kurdish or there are no uh, Kurdish schools, uh, 
Um, yes, this is, I mean, the enrollment rate, I mean, historically was always lower for Kurdish areas and the compliance rate, of course, with mandatory compulsory education is very low in Kurdish areas. Of course, this is not only um, a function of ethnicity, but uh, other things like the power of local elites and how much they are allies with the newly founded republic, but uh, still this affected students' enrollment rates and probably future social and economic outcomes. Okay, we made it. I would like to, uh, like everyone to join me uh, in thanking uh, the presenters and the discussant for uh, excellent uh, work and excellent uh, input. Uh, so <laughs> and uh, I would also want to apologize for uh, going over time with this panel. I mean, if I'd done this, this in Switzerland, I probably would have been fired. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I wish you all a bon appetit. Before we leave the auditorium, um, all the sponsored participants, please remember to drop by the um, travel support office um, at the library. Yes, um, during this break. Thank you. <laughs>